Hey, welcome back to Neckbeardia. Here with you with the last part of Not For Sale. No need to dawdle, let's go ahead and get into it. Super Dave is smiling like the magnificent bastard that he is now. The DM is starting to comprehend and get the same smile. Six is not smiling. Six is very not smiling. He's looking back and forth and wondering what these two know. Besides all of his important details, are they going to turn him into the cops? Are they going to follow him home? Burn his house down? What the hell are this fat bearded man and this grinning redneck going to do to him? So, did you enjoy Dixie Dynamite and the All-Star Tick Queens? God only knows what Six thought at that very moment. See, turns out that ever since he turned 18, he'd been hitting the porn room at the video store pretty hard. Her, her, her. In the last eight years, he'd apparently been renting at least once a week. Probably why he hooked up with 12 and his crew to help support his porn habit. Yeah, man, I've been meaning to ask you about that. See, when you brought it back, the tape actually wasn't in the box. I've been meaning to get back to you about the late charges and all, but you're such a good customer, I hadn't really thought about it. Super Dave paused here and rubbed his chin as he made a show of thinking. Hey, is your phone number still the same as the number on your mom's account? Six squealed on his friend like a bitch. He tells the DM and Super Dave everything he knows about 12, where his hangout spots are, where he lives, all of it. When pressed on the subject of the robbery, he professed to know nothing, claiming he'd been home whacking it to 30 men for Sandy that night and to check his rentals if we didn't believe him. Well, hell, when a man says he was home whacking it to gangbang porn, who were upright citizens like the DM and Super Dave to doubt him? As they got back into the car and the DM asked Super Dave, Hey, did he really not return Dixie Dynamite? Man, I stuck that thing in the bargain bin and then bought it myself three months ago. It was decided that if they were going to confront 12, they should change over to Super Dave's truck. Partly because the thick layer of mud would obscure the license plate to any onlookers. You've probably seen these sort of trucks before. They look like they've been almost submerged in pure mud puddle and gotten that thick layer of earth caked all around the vehicle. With only the vaguely clean bit being the windshield where the wipers had cleared it away. Well, Super Dave's was like that except that it was a mini truck. And he'd run out of wiper fluid long ago and simply use a garden hose to spray down his windshield. Now in the Dave Mobile, the DM and Super Dave headed for 12's place. It was a little house in the run-down part of town. Super Dave pulled into the empty driveway and he and the DM got out. 12. Hey 12. Why they called out to him even as they were walking up to the door, I don't know. Maybe at this point they thought they were immersed in some sort of gaming world. But they walked up to the door. Super Dave rang the doorbell repeatedly and they waited. Called out a few more times. Nothing. Finally, Super Dave shrugged and absentmindedly twisted the little box with the doorbell button until it snapped and dangled by the wires. Guess he's not home. If 12 wasn't at home, then according to what they heard from 6, there was one place he was likely to be. About 20 minutes outside of town down the highway, there was a fireworks stand. It had been converted from its original purpose of an ice cream stand and thus still had a long wooden roof awning, stools, and a counter. It opened for a month in the summer and two weeks in December. The rest of the time, it was apparently a good place for certain people to meet up with their out-of-town contacts and restock, since there was shade and a place to sit. Knowing it was quite possible they'd miss him completely in passing on the highway, Super Dave and the DM nevertheless set out towards a firework stand, determined to confront the villain. And the sun was practically gone as Super Dave and the DM drew within sight of the closed firework stand. As they passed, the DM looked at the two cars parked there and the two guys standing there. One guy with dreadlocks wearing a Metallica t-shirt and jeans, one bald guy in a tank top with baggy black pants. Bingo. Super Dave, however, kept driving. He continued on until the stand was out of sight, then pulled off the highway and up to the gate of one of those houses as like a cross between a ranch and a shack. What are we doing? Waiting for a couple of minutes. Patience, Grasshopper. Super Dave waited for the length of the hairband song on the radio, 
then backed up and turned back onto the highway, heading back towards town, not going too fast. As they went back towards town, they saw one of the cars that had been parked the fireworks stand past them. The other was pulling out of the stand's parking area and heading back towards town as well. Both knew that must be 12. They settled in behind him and as it got dark, Dave flicked on his headlights. This was not the world's most subtle tailing job, nor did it seem that it was supposed to be. Whether 12 had actually noticed the muddy truck earlier or was just feeling a bit paranoid was unclear, but he eventually noticed. He pulled off the highway and onto a farm to market road. Super Dave followed. They continued on this little country road for a little while. Maybe 12 was hoping this mud-coated truck behind him was going to pull off at any time. But finally, he pulled over to the side of the road and gets out of the car, slamming the door. As Super Dave pulls over behind him, he's calling, Hey, what's your problem, man? Super Dave and the DM get out of the truck, and the DM comes towards 12, calling back. My problem is that you stole my shit. I know that you stole my shit, and I want it back. The DM was angry. He was really angry. He'd had his home broken into. He felt violated and abused. And finally in front of him was a man who had done it. Who had thrown the things he loved around like so much junk looking for quick cash. He'd taken one of the things that the DM truly took pride in. And the DM was going to have it back. Twelve was angry too. He was pissed. I think all of us had seen someone get angry like this before. It was anger without justification, without reason. It came from a life where you believed you were entitled to whatever you saw just because you wanted it. And that anyone that didn't just hand it over was doing you wrong. From the guy that sneers at the government and flips off the country even as he cashes his disability check. To the BMW driving yuppie going off on someone working minimum wage because he couldn't get the breakfast menu an hour after they stopped serving it. It was the furious anger of a two-year-old throwing a tantrum channeled through an adult body. How dare the DM try to get in his face? How dare he? If 12 was pissed at being confronted, being punched in the face probably didn't make it much better. Now let me tell you a bit about the DM. He's a fat nerd and pretty much always has been. But somewhere under that fat is a layer of sturdy muscle. We're not talking the kingpin here, but he spent his youth bicycling and walking around town. And his first job was with a moving company. While the muscles he developed during all that time hadn't been maintained, they weren't totally gone either. Twelve was knocked back against the car, then he shoved himself up and threw his own punch. I'd love to tell you something out of a martial arts anime, where the pure power of the righteous fury let the DM duck and weave like he was Jet Li, avoiding every strike and hitting back with pure precision powered by Manlius. But that was not the way the story was told to me, so that's not how I'm going to tell it to you. What happened was that the DM got hit in the cheek and staggered back. Then he and Twelve began the tussle, trying to hit and punch each other, but too angry and getting in too close, more shoving at each other than anything. Super Dave was nowhere. Apparently he felt this was something the DM wanted to do himself. Or needed to. Or just didn't think he could clobber 12 when they were in that close. It was somewhere between a schoolyard tussle and a boxer's clinch. The punch is not damaging either of them a lot, but hurting enough to make them angrier and angrier. Finally the DM roared and shoved forward with both his arms and the power of his legs, smacking 12 against the side of his car and knocking him down. The DM stood there between the vehicles, panting and sweating, fists still clenched. He didn't move on his downed opponent, he just stood there, glaring at him. I want my fucking Illuminati cards. Twelve snarled. Sure, he had no use for the cards, he couldn't even sell them. But he'd taken them so they were his, and no fat bearded son of a bitch was going to take them away. He got on his feet, hand having dived into the pocket of his baggy pants. When it came out, it had a knife in it. Not a huge one, probably right at the legal limit for blade length, but it flipped out quick, and his grip on it was white knuckled. No one doubted he was ready to use it. Twelve did not move, neither did the DM for the matter, though he hadn't sensed the knife had come out. But according to what I was told, yes, it is like the movies. Even if it's a little quieter than on screen, the pump action of a shotgun makes for a great attention getter. Now, I want you to think about what you're about to do there, Super Dave said. 
calm as could be as he held the shotgun in kind of an odd low grip he developed, with the fore end pretty much just resting against the palm of his bad left hand. You see, you might hurt my friend there real bad with that knife. Real bad. He'll be in the hospital for days, maybe weeks. On the other hand, I'll kill you with the shotgun. From what I was given to understand, Super Dave probably actually had a cult snub nose in his back pocket taken from the truck. It would have been a lot more accurate, and not necessitated him having to hold the rifle barrel up for a potentially minutes long standoff. But much like the cops will tell you that laser sights have done wonders for toning down criminal bravado, being shot is an abstract concept. Knowing exactly where you're going to be shot is terrifying. The shotgun made a very big, very obvious point. Drop the knife. Twelve dropped the knife. Hey, hey man, come on. Twelve was nervous now. He clearly never actually had someone up to score on him in this sort of situation. Come on, man, you're gonna kill me over a PlayStation and some fucking nerd cards? No. No, I'm not gonna kill you. Not unless you force me by getting violent. But what I will do is let my very angry friend there get the blackjack out of my truck and knock your ass cold. We will then remove your clothes, remove your phone, destroy your tires, and leave your naked ass here in the country to walk home. Twelve stared at him. He probably never heard such a thing in his life, but Dave had been playing intimidating characters for years and role-playing them out with gusto. Fuck. Fuck, man. Shit's in my trunk. From Twelve's trunk, the DM recovered his PlayStation, his microwave, his VCR, and several of his tapes. Most importantly, tossed over in the corner and laying on its side was the gray plastic box, latch still secured properly by a genial shop guy. That's fucking all, man. A guy I was with took the rest of your shit to get sold. I ain't even seen him again. Twelve looked nervously back and forth between Super Dave, who had shifted his stance a few times and was still holding the shotgun in his general direction, and the DM who was putting the microwave in the back of Super Dave's truck. You gonna turn me into the cops or something? Super Dave looked over at the DM and tilted his head a bit. The DM blinked, but shrugged, giving Super Dave the go-ahead. The shotgun-wielding gamer looked back at 12. No, I'm not gonna turn you in, but I do want you to listen to what I have to say. 12 looked disbelieving, but there was still enough fight in him to be snide. He looked at Super Dave like he had a cow sticking out of his nose, then glanced over at the truck. He must have seen the American flag attached to the antenna, because he snorted. Yeah, man. What, you gonna school me about the American Dream or something? That's exactly what I'm gonna tell you about. That's such bullshit. People work hard, don't get shit, ain't no point in it. What the fuck do you know about the American Dream? So are you gonna be robbing apartments ten years from now? Twenty? Super Dave frowned at him. You don't think you can get ahead so you'll just do this? You gonna be standing in front of the strip mall selling pot when you're eighty? Twelve scowled at him, but didn't say anything else, so Dave explained. Good buddy of mine, his parents came over here from Korea. They didn't have jack shit to their names. Didn't have anything but a friend of the family that would let them stay at his place. They both went right out and they got the first jobs they could. They worked hard, real hard. They got better jobs. They had my buddy, and they worked harder than ever. Eventually, they managed to buy a convenience store to run themselves. You telling me that's the American dream, man? I work real, real hard. Someday can own my own convenience store to keep working real, real hard till I'm old? No, that's not the American dream. It's pretty good, but it's not the American dream. Super Dave had raised the shotgun and settled it against his shoulder and shook his head. The DM said that he knew this was sincere. No boasting, no role-playing, no hamming it up. This was the very essence of Super Dave's identity, and he was speaking from the heart. The dream was in my buddy. They came here with nothing, and they managed to climb up to owning a convenience store that paid their rent and paid for their food. But it also paid for my buddy's college fund. He's getting ready for medical school right now. Gonna be a heart surgeon. Probably gonna be a good one, too. He's gonna save people's lives. That, my man, is the American dream. Maybe you won't have everything you dream of from working real hard. Maybe you can't be rich and famous and beloved by coming up from nothing. But your kids can because of what you gave them. Twelve was silent now, just staring at Super Dave. Super Dave took a deep breath, then raised his chin a little. Listen, 
You can just keep on going on like you are. Maybe you'll be okay. Maybe you'll wind up in jail or just miserable. Or maybe you can go ahead. Maybe you can work hard. Real hard. And maybe someday you can look at the things your kids have accomplished and feel that it was all worth it. Super Dave walked over to the side of his truck and DM went in and got in on the passenger side. Super Dave looked at 12 again and said, If you don't listen to anything else I said, just listen to this. From now on, whenever you do something, think about what your kids would think of you if they heard about it someday. And think of what your mama would think of you. As Super Dave got into the truck and returned the shotgun, pausing to disarm it, don't ask me how, Waifu didn't know it when asked the DM just said, well it was his shotgun, he knew how to work it, to the gun rack. The DM sat there with his box of Illuminati cards in his lap. He just looked at them as Super Dave started the truck and backed up, turning the truck carefully on the packed dirt road to head back to town. Finally the DM spoke up. Dude, do you really have a blackjack in here? Super Dave grinned. Fuck no man, those things are illegal. They drove off and left 12 there, sitting back against the trunk of his car staring after them. If I was dedicated to doing the purest and most awesome good impossible, here is where it would tell you that 12 turned his life around. That he showed up the next day at the DM's place, having gotten the rest of his stuff back. That he apologized, paid for the window, and went on to work in the same place as the DM until they became bros and 12 joined us in their glory. But I can't tell you that because I don't know. The DM never saw him again, and he never heard anyone else mention him either. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but today's sponsor is Elemental Games. Elemental Games is the largest seller of tabletop role-playing related products in the UK, and they also sell to most other countries at a great price. With 15-25% to off Games Workshop products, it's hard to say no. However, they sell a lot more than just Games Workshop products. They sell every popular war game you can think of, as well as board games, card games and role playing games. Thinking about picking up an airbrush and trying some new painting techniques? Or what about sprucing up your gaming table and getting some new terrain and battle maps? Then consider getting it with elemental games. But enough of that, let's get back to the video. So, did 12 decide that Super Dave's heartfelt speech about the wonders of America was too long and didn't listen? Did he just decide to move on to some other town to continue his criminal ways, having decided that this one had gotten too crazy? Did the cops pick him up for possession or while breaking into someone's house? Did he get mad at the wrong guy, someone that didn't want to believe in the best of people like Super Dave did, and wound up with bullet holes in his chest? We'll probably never know. Personally, when I think about the story sometimes, when it just comes to mind late at night, I'd like to think that 12 just decided to go somewhere new and start over. That he worked real hard, found someone to cherish, and is making plans to make sure that future generations will have a brighter tomorrow. Maybe he even bought a convenience store. Those nights, I wonder what he'd tell people the number 12 on his neck stood for now. Super Dave drove the DM back to Super Dave's place where the DM could pick up his car. Super Dave said he needed to look the shotgun over, then he'd do a beer run and drop by the DM's place if it was cool. The DM said it was definitely cool. The DM went back to his apartment and he unlocked the door. The books had all been put back in their places, the glass had been cleaned up, the window replaced, all days ago, obviously. The TV had been replaced by an old one his sister no longer needed. Not as big or as nice, but it would do. The DM spent a little while hooking his VCR up to it, hooking the PlayStation through that, testing it to make sure it still worked. He set the microwave back in its place and started the hot pocket zapping. And finally, he put the gray plastic box with his Illuminati collection in it back on the highest shelf of the bookshelves that his father had left him. His world was starting to make sense again. Super Dave arrived, Guinness in hand. Wizard once told me Super Dave actually hated the stuff. His taste ran purely to American piss style beers. The wizard added that it didn't seem to be particularly linked to the patriotism. That was just Super Dave's taste. Around the DM, he'd swill what I personally called dishwater in a can happily like it was an elixir of life. They sat down on the couch with a liquid bread and Super Dave asked if the DM wanted to see Dixie Dynamite and the All-Star Tick Queens. The DM suggested Spaceballs instead. 
They settled on Barbarella as a compromise. As they watched the classic movie, Super Dave looked over at the shelf in its gray plastic box. Then he looked at the DM and grinned. Feel better, man? Yeah, I feel better. Cool. How about you? What, me? I'm awesome. Yeah, Super Dave, you are. I would like to say that this was merely my first brush with Super Dave, hearing about him secondhand. I would like to tell you that there were many awesome stories involving Super Dave after this tale of good triumphing over evil. Sadly, though there were many other tales of prior awesomeness involving Super Dave, this one was to be one of the last. Shortly thereafter, circumstances required the DM to start working overtime, not because he could, but because he had to in order to survive. Super Dave's beloved mama got real sick for a while, and Super Dave moved back home to help his dad take care of her. Game night had to be called off. The DM and Super Dave were still the broest of bros, though. Had they not already been, the events of that week would have fire-forged them as such. Though they grew apart with adult responsibilities, they always made time to share what was going on. When Super Dave's mama beat breast cancer, they threw her a party and ceremonially, <laughs> and ceremonially awarded her XP. <laughs> she didn't really understand it, but she, was, but she loved it all the same. That's funny. Super Dave died in December of 1998. It's not clear what the other driver was on, but he was definitely DUI. That's all the DM ever really learned about the criminal side of the case. He didn't want to push Super Dave's mama for details. Maybe he didn't really want the details. Super Dave was going around his dad's car after luring the beer he'd bought at the convenience store into the trunk. The other guy pulled up a parking space a few spaces down so hard he actually did most of a circle, his rear bumper striking Super Dave's car and pushing it hard. Super Dave was struck and knocked through the air and into a cement ravine, hitting his head. He never woke up, and surgery was unsuccessful. He was pronounced dead within four hours of the accident. The DM was devastated. We used that word a lot, but for him it was really true. While the DM had siblings of his own, they were very different from him. Super Dave had been a kindred spirit, someone who had gotten him through hard times, who had enriched his life who had actually saved his life. He had never been that close to anyone at that point in his life, even family members. And he'd actually let himself grow apart from him in only two short years. Now he was gone. The DM's world was suddenly a very empty place. The DM did what he could to console Super Dave's mama, but there wasn't much consoling he could do, or that anyone could do for him. He had the other guys from the group, but they weren't exactly hug you, tell you, it'll be okay friends. And many of them were going through their own unique, lonely morning. Several days after the accident, enough had been settled regarding the criminal investigation that a date could be set for Super Dave's funeral. He himself spoke of these events only once. But of attending the funeral, the DM told me, I remember thinking that I just wished to God I could pay someone to beat the shit out of me instead of having to actually sit there and wait to say goodbye to him. But he had to go. He was Super Dave's best friend. Of course, he was a pallbearer. It was three days before the funeral when he remembered the shield. The Dean was in a panic. His best friend's one wish about his funeral, however jokingly it had been intended, was going to go unfulfilled because of him. He raced around town to every costume shop, prop store, and nerd place he could. Not even a hint of a Captain America shield. Finally, he hit up eBay and discovered a custom costume prop someone had made. Good, dense, hard plastic. It said actual leather straps, proper engravings for the lines and stars, hand painted. A shield fit for a true American hero. He contacted the seller direct and pleaded with him to just sell it to him outright. Eventually, an agreement was reached and the DM ponied up to have it sent overnight to make sure it would arrive in time. The next morning, fairly early, there was a knock on the door and the sound of a truck driving off almost immediately. The DM hurried out and stared in growing horror at the box with a deep dent in the top. Praying that it would be aimed at the underside of the shield, he carefully opened it. The seller had done a great job packing it. Plenty of peanuts, a plastic wrapper on the shield itself, he'd done his best. 
It still had managed to stop FedEx from putting a gash in the paint running from an almost dead center of a star out to the edge, where there was now a ding in the raised lipped edge of the shield. The DM confided to me years later that sometimes he still wishes he could get his hands on that FedEx driver. There was nothing he could do. The DM didn't have the proper materials to work with this. He had some 40k mini paint, but what about color matching? And he didn't even know what sort of plastic this was, if the paint would bond properly. But getting to the spare, he loaded the shield into his car and drove to the local game store to seek an expert opinion. Genial shop guy took a look at the shield and said that yeah, he was pretty sure he knew what it was. But without knowing the brand of paint the maker had used, it was pretty much out of luck for color matching. The only real option was to strip it off carefully and probably repaint the whole thing. The DM bowed his head and leaned on the counter. Genial shop guy just looked at him for a minute. Is this for Super Dave? The DM looked up at Genial shop guy and nodded. Genial shop guy nodded slowly in return then looked at the shield again. He rubbed his thumb over the scratch and nudged his thumbnail into the ding at the edge. He turned it over once or twice, looking at the whole thing. Then he looked up again. Write your address down for me. I'll have it to you by 7 a.m. As the DM walked back to his car, he noticed that there were other people behind him in the parking lot. When he turned, he realized it was because the closed sign had been put up in the local game store's window. At 6.57 a.m., the DM's doorbell rang. When he opened the door, there was no sign of Genial Shop Guy. What there was, was a Captain America shield leaned against the railing opposite his apartment door. The flat but well done paint job had been replaced entirely by metallics. In the light from inside the apartment and the light from the street lamps, the red, white, and blue gleamed like only adamantium should be able to gleam. The DM carefully picked it up and took it inside. The whole thing was done perfectly, not a smudge, not a brush line. The raised edge was gone, thereby removing the nick, making the shield more of a perfect dome, just as it was in the comics. A shield fit for a true American hero, intended for one, delivered by one. The DM walked into the church with his back straight, head held high and Captain America's shield on his arm. He had determined that he would not feel silly. He would not care about curious glances or odd looks. He was honoring the best man he'd ever known, and he would not be ashamed. He looked around the crowd, seeking familiar faces, determined to ignore strangers with shock or disdain in their eyes. He immediately saw four more red, white, and blue circles looking back at him. They were on the arms of his friends, who themselves were standing with heads raised and challenging looks on their faces. Friends who had known Super Dave, laughed with Super Dave, who had slain dragons with him, calculated warp jumps with him, discussed Daleks going upstairs with him. The DM heard someone coming behind him and turned. It was Wizard, his normal t-shirt, batter jacket, and beret gone replaced with what seemed to be the same black suit every other male in the place was wearing. Back then his beard was shorter, his bald spot not yet gleaming, hair only dark gray. He looked at the DM. He looked at the shield. He raised an eyebrow. Wizard stopped in front of the DM and just looked at him. He raised a hand, rubbed his beard thoughtfully, then he reached out that hand and placed it on the DM's shoulder. My friend, I am sorry for your loss. All of our loss. They hugged. The DM said that the sound of his plastic shield clinking against the wizard's tin one somehow wasn't funny at all. Then, it was time. The moment the DM had been dreading. He wondered what they were going to do with the shields. Should they all get together and choose among them who would put their shield with Super Dave? Should they put all of the shields in? Should they just put the shields in right now? Should they take them off and set them aside before the service actually began? Honoring their friend was one thing. Challenging strangers was one thing. But Super Dave's mama and dad weren't likely to understand. And that was something else entirely. But first he had to get it out of the way. Actually going up to the casket and looking down, saying goodbye to Super Dave. The DM made his way up to the front of the church, People making way for him, some looking, some merely by reflex of letting those in mourning go through the ritual. 
The DM stopped when he could see the edge of the casket. Could he do this? Could he go on? Would Super Dave still bear the wounds of his death? Would that be better or worse than to see him looking as if he was just sleeping? His hand tightened on the leather of the shield strap. He wasn't sure if he was praying to God or to Captain America to give him the strength he needed. He wasn't even religious. Finally, he stepped forward. He looked down at Super Dave's face, knowing this would be the last time he would see him. He forced his eyes right there, knowing that if he didn't, he might never be able to look, never be able to say goodbye. But still, out of the corner of his eye, he saw the colors. He looked. The casket must have been picked partly because it was wide enough to accommodate the shield. It was resting on Super Dave's chest like a golden sword of a fallen warrior king. A window was cut into the star of the center, showing a photo of Super Dave when he was a child. A cardboard circle marked with finger paint strapped to his arm with a kite string. His smiling parents on either side of him. The DM turned his head, finding Super Dave's mama where she sat in the front pew. She was smiling at him through tears. All six of Super Dave's pallbearers carried their friend with one hand and Captain America's shield with the other. I never got to know Super Dave, which may account for the fact that these events come off a bit as if I'm eulogizing a hero of legend rather than a slightly crazy good old boy nerd. But you'd have to understand the tone of voice people use when they describe their experiences with him. The sound of wonder, delight, even awe as they recount his exploits. Or just the smile whenever someone says like, Oh hey, remember that time where Super Dave actually played an elf? These are the people that I spend all of my social time with. Since our meeting was never to be, I have to judge him on the impressions he left with them. Impressions that are still going strong. They still miss him. The DM still misses him. I know. After a Super Dave story has been told, sometimes he'll just get quiet for a while, as if lost to the memories. And then every so often, he'll look at me and he'll grin and he'll say, man, I wish you and Super Dave had gotten to meet. The fact that I can't help but feel honored in some way when he says that is the reason I couldn't tell Super Dave's most awesome story without also telling the story of his death. Somehow it seems wrong to share that greatness with the world without also explaining how the world was deprived of further such stories. Ah, but what happened to the shields, you ask? Most of Super Dave's friends took them home. One of them, who shelled out for an actual metal shield, patted him back and with multiple straps as if it were combat ready, gave his to Super Dave's mama. I've seen pictures of it where it hangs in her entryway. I asked Wizard what he did with his, and he just shrugged and said that such blatantly patriotic stuff usually annoyed him, and it was put away somewhere. I took that to mean that it was probably sitting in a box in his closet, where he could look at the box instead and remember every time he got out that ratty old jacket. The other three I'm not certain of, maybe I'll ask the guys the next time I run into them. But you're probably most interested in what happened to the DM shield. Does it hang in a place of honor? Somewhere we can all see it every week, presiding over our games as if watching us. I suppose you could say the first part's true, the second not quite. About a week after the funeral, the DM headed back to the local game store. He knew Genial Shop Guy had no doubt been invited to the funeral, but didn't recall seeing him there. But he did know that a bright, shiny shield had turned up that morning on his doorstep, as promised without a single cent asked for or paid. Thank you, the DM said to the genial shop guy. You can't understand how much it meant that you did that. Maybe I do, genial shop guy replied, grinning. No, you really don't. The DM set the shield on the countertop and gently slid it across. But maybe this will help you too, someday. The shield hangs in the local game store to this day. It is most definitely not for sale.
Thank you for coming to Nick Beardia and listening to the story. If you like the story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Nick Beardia, as well as click the bell icon so you know when the videos are released through the week. If you like original stories written through the week, fresh from my hand, stop by Guard Beardia as well, and have a listen to the Veil Rider series and the Emily Braun series. The story hit a little hard with me, because during my last bit of part in the army, doing my medical evaluation board, I was put on funeral detail. So, uh, buried a few people in my time, and lost quite a few friends along the way. It's something that just kind of sticks with you, I guess. But until I see you next time on this side of the veil, this has been Guard Bro.